it. So thank you all for uh, being here. And uh, let me turn it over to you. Um, we, we have Matt Biggs, who's the Secretary Treasurer of the International Federation of Professional and Technical Engineers. Uh, thank you uh, for being here as one of the union leaders. Uh, really what we're, we, we want to hear the stories of uh, the individuals <coughs> impacting. So do you want to, I, I don't know if there's a, uh, you want me to turn it over to uh, you or is there anybody else who wants to <coughs> go first? Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. Yeah, I am Matt Biggs of IFPT, Professional Technical Engineers. I'll just be very quick. Um, I IFPT, we have over 10,000 people uh, out on furlough right now. We are NASA's biggest uh, federal employee union. We represent 8,000 NASA workers uh, nationwide, thousands that live right here in Maryland. Um, so we really appreciate the effort of Senator Van Hollen. Uh, we support uh, your strategy moving forward to block any legislation from coming to the Senate floor before the spending bills that pass the House in bipartisan fashion come to the Senate floor and pass the Senate, which they can do. Um, and uh, I'll defer to our members. I'll, I'll just say this. Th this shutdown is a shutdown created by President Trump. It's his shutdown. He embraced the shutdown. Um, and we urge Senator McConnell, the leader of the Senate, um, to bring these bills to the, to the Senate floor and not, uh, not allow President Trump to decide what comes to the Senate floor and what doesn't. If Senator McConnell does not allow these bills to the Senate floor, this will be his shutdown as much as it is President Trump's shutdown. So with that, I uh, have Anel Flores and Trish Moten from Local 29 IFPT that work right down the road here at Goddard uh, NASA. So Great. Let me, turn it over. let me just, as, as you start, uh, emphasize a point, though, Matt made, because uh, you probably saw the stories about the negotiations at the White House that Mitch McConnell wasn't there. This is the Republican leader of the Senate, and Republican senators are ducking their constitutional responsibilities to do their part to reopen the government. And Mitch McConnell has it within his power today to bring up those two bills that passed the House to reopen the government. And so they shouldn't be hiding out. Right now you've got Senate Republicans who are AWOL when we have this big government shutdown. Let's come back today, uh, tomorrow when the Senate comes back into session, and let's vote on those House bills as the first uh, order of business. And uh, I know the President said a little while ago he would be proud to shut down the government. Nobody should be proud of shutting down the government, denying pay to 800,000 Americans, and depriving millions of others of important services. So with that, uh, let me turn it over uh, to, to you. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, first of all, Senator Van Hollen, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm president of, uh, of GESTA, which is the Goddard Engineer Scientists and Technicians Association and NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And many of the employees are devastated by the shutdown. Um, and certainly the majority are really facing hardships. You know, they have bills to pay, they have families, uh, mortgages, uh, rents are due, are coming due. Uh, they're not, they may not be able to make some of those payments. And also, people are going to be deciding on whether, you know, what bill they have to pay, whether they're going to be able to eat. I want to remind you that some 80% of all Americans live paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that should not happen in this country. This is the United States of America. I mean, this is certainly um, a really a terrible thing to have to happen, and certainly our most vulnerable, our youngest, our newest employees also suffer uh, from these type of shutdowns. We want to get back to work. We want to be able to do our jobs. Most of our employees are highly dedicated. They're motivated. They love their country, and we want to go back to work. So anything that you can do to help us get back there, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for your service. Well, good Thank afternoon. You. Um, <clears throat> my name is Eric Fronin, National Vice President for the American Federation of Government Employees, District 14. And we represent, uh, I believe, the largest amount of employees who will be impacted by this. Um, I'm going to call it what it is. Okay, I'm going to tell it all. This craziness. Okay, um, <clears throat> our employees nationwide are being impacted by this heavily in this metropolitan area where the majority of them are. are. Um, as the gentleman stated, you know, our employees live paycheck to paycheck. Okay, um, it's devastating not knowing which, as he said, what bills you're going to pay, what can I uh, pay, what can I pay. And it, for the president to use the federal employees as a pawn in the game, okay, it's ridiculous. Okay, and, and I'll put Mick McConnell on that too, all right? As you said, we support you and the other uh, uh, remaining um, elected leaders in opening the government. And 
then go back to the table and negotiate whatever you need from Board of Security. Board of Security is, is an issue. We represent those members too, yes. okay? All right, so we know there's an issue with Board of Security. <coughs> However, we should not use 10 to 15 agencies to push that agenda, okay? We shouldn't use that to push that agenda. The President has already announced at least more than one way that he can fund this thing. Why is he doing it on the backs of the, the government employees, okay? That's the problem we have, okay? We should not be, as I stated earlier, putting these government employees upon trying to figure out day to day what we're going to do in reference to. We need to open the government back so we can go back to work. We got a bunch of dedicated workers right now, over 400,000 of them TSA employees who are working without pay, border security working without pay, jails are working without pay. Okay? Yeah. We need to fund these agencies immediately and put people back to work. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And th I want to thank uh, you, Eric, and all your colleagues at AFGE. Uh, for your leadership in standing up for federal employees and the rights of federal employees, and thank you for being here. Well, I'm Trisha Moten. Uh, I'm an employee at NASA Goddard, and I'm also an area vice president for Augusta, which is uh, affiliated directly with IFPTE Local 29. Um, I have talked to several employees who've just reached out to me uh, since the furlough, expressing their concerns, wanting to know if the union's involved in what we're doing. And I gave them uh, the feedback that we're meeting today with Senator Van Hollen and, uh, to talk about this. And so I'm hoping that they'll get the word and I'll pass it on to those who've reached out directly that we are, in fact, engaging uh, the Congress and trying to make sure that our voices are heard, that their voices are heard. And we want you to know that they appreciate what you're doing. They're watching the news and they're seeing what you're doing, Senator, and they're really appreciative of everything. Um, I can offer my personal statement, which I actually noted here. Uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, I moved here about eight years ago. I was a, f a federal contractor for 14 years. I'm an aerospace engineer. Uh, I used to do rocket science there in Huntsville, and I was a contractor. So I moved here for a federal job, for the security of a federal job. Uh, and I've now been here eight years. January 5th, 2011 is when I moved. Um, at this point, it's really uh, a little bit stressful for me, too, because as a senior engineer, I also have some struggles because I used a lot of my savings to take care of financial obligations. To I'm a single woman, so I paid down all of my credit cards, took care of all my debts from the layoff of being, having been laid off back there <coughs> eight years ago um, so that I could secure a mortgage. And just today, I received a call, went in for a meeting with my mortgage lender saying, we're going to have uh, your mortgage scheduled for January 30th, 2019, are you going to be able to show up and take care of this? Uh, we have to have pay stubs leading up to that date. I don't have pay stubs to give them right now, and I don't know if I will. So that's a concern for me, and that's why I wanted to make that known that uh, those of us who are uh, somewhat uh, successful in this field and doing well working for the federal government don't have it easy either when things like this face us. How am I going to secure a mortgage? How am I going to take care of that if our paychecks are being held up? How am I going to prove that I'm gainfully employed if the president is threatening to keep the government closed for months and maybe years? That's really ludicrous for me personally, as well as for those of who have reached out to me. One of my colleagues also said uh, to me just yesterday, he's uh, recently separated from his wife. He's a retired, just recently retired Navy veteran, uh, works for us at NASA, and also said he has very similar hardships. He doesn't know how he's going to make his rent because he's been separated. He's having to take care of his finances in both households. He's, they've got kids in college, two of whom were still in college. One graduated, and he and his wife, he said, his son and his son's wife are now employed by the federal government, both of whom are laid off working for different agencies that are furloughed. So they're worried about how they're going to take care of their new children, their new two new, newborn children. So there, it's, it's hitting everywhere, and it's really important that people understand that this is not just uh, something easy where we can just, just go talk to our landlords and do some work <laughs> and, and take care of our rent payments. That's kind of a ludicrous statement that I heard over the news this past week uh, that was made by the administration's office, and I just don't think that they're reaching out and understanding how this really is impacting folks, and I just want to make that known. Thank you. No, you, and every day that goes on, people are getting – Squeezed more and more, obviously. Yeah. Just go down the line. Okay, uh, I'm David Norkin. I'm an administrator. I'm I'm with uh, AFGE Local 3614. Uh, we represent uh, EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, 
uh, employees uh, in uh, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Uh, we have many of our uh, – I'm, I'm, I'm on furlough right now. We have uh, most of our employees on furlough, uh, almost 100 uh, percent of them. And uh, there are many of them, especially the GS5, the 13s, are living uh, paycheck, to paycheck to paycheck. Many of my own colleagues, I'm sure, are living paycheck to paycheck uh, uh, at this point in time. Uh, I strongly urge uh, that the uh, Senate to adopt the House bills to open the government. Uh, those would be very important. Um, uh, we have people coming in, in terms of about our being able to pr provide service. In the private sector, uh, uh, people are coming in to file charges all the time, and uh, it may be that those people are getting very, very short service, but they're not really getting served. And also, uh, they're putting their, those, those uh, individuals' cases are not being uh, investigated. In terms of the pro federal sector, I, I decide uh, cases that federal employees file, discrimination cases that federal employees file against their agencies. We just recently got a, uh, some numerical performance standards that we never had before that are very high that makes it extremely difficult for us to do anything but close cases rather than uh, to pursue cases that merit discrimination when the evidence, um, uh, when the weight of the evidence supports it. Um, I, this shutdown. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we are uh, canceling cases, we're canceling hearings, uh, postponing things, and uh, it's going to make be even more impossible for me to be able to uh, pursue findings of discrimination where the evidence warrants it now that we're, we have these extremely high quotas and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, no time to do anything but to work on closing cases. Uh, it's it's a shame. It, it's uh, I have a hundred cases assigned to me. Uh, it's going to have a spreading effect, uh, and people just simply, simply aren't going to get served. They're not going to be able to be able to you know put time on their cases. Thank you for sharing that. And I would I would point out that uh, a lot of the conversation around the shutdown has been around border security, uh, but just like you're not able to do the work on your cases, you've got a lot of immigration judges uh, at the border whose cases are are piling up uh, as well, making a, a situation worse. Um, so I, I think a lot of people don't appreciate that uh, we've got all sorts of, uh, you know, efforts going on in different agencies that are affecting people, the IRS and tax season, uh, mortgage payments and farm service uh, bureaus. But the, the, the impact, the negative and harmful impact is spreading rapidly. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Senator Van Hollen. My name is Otis Johnson. I am the president of AFGE Council 1 in District 14. I'm also the treasurer for AFGE Local 1831, which, is, which covers the members at the National Gallery of Arts in Washington, D.C. Um, a lot of my members are single parents, a lot, and they live paycheck to paycheck, and this furlough is definitely hurting our members. This weekend, um, I saw President Trump give a press conference where he says that um, he can relate to how the federal employee is feeling. Well, I say, Mr. President, if you can relate to how the federal employee is feeling, you need to go ahead and open the government back up so our people that want to work can get back to work and handle America's business. And I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Amen. Hello. Um, I'm Tara McClellan. I'm with AFGE Local 727, and I work at Court Services, an offender supervision agency in Washington, D.C. We do the parole and probation for Washington, D.C. I am on furlough, but I'm considered an essential employee. And in our agency, we have both. Now, if you think of us as the head, as essential employees, non-essential employees are the neck. So we can't move without no neck. We are broken in our agency. And the effects that this has had, I know everybody's talking about mortgage, car payments, car insurance. 
But let's just talk about little things like medication, over-the-counter medication. We're talking about as of Friday, I got to figure out which over-the-counter medication I need to go get. Do I go get the allergy medication? If my daughter has a cold, do I get her cold medication? Of course, she's going to win because she's a child. But those are the little things that affect us. We have um, our chief shop steward just became a grandmother. Her daughter had to have an emergency C-section. The baby is, has some complications, but when she left the hospital, the people who put her that grandchild on her insurance weren't there to do that. So she's out of pocket until the people, those so-called non-essentials come to work. This hurts in so many different ways. School lunch is a big deal. I have a 13-year-old. She had told me, she said, oh, my, I don't have any money in my school account for lunch. My personality said, me either. I ain't got no money for lunch either. <laughs> but we're going to make this work. So I went on to the school website, and I, I applied for free and reduced lunch. Here I am as an essential employee, have to get up and go to work every day. And I'm trying to figure out how to get my child lunch. Then, as an essential employee, I have to figure out how to get to work. I don't have the money to do that either. There's no paycheck coming in to get gas. Those who are eligible for Metro benefits, they won't be eligible for them until February. So where are they going to get to work between now and February? This hurts so much. That's all I have well, to say. Well, that's, that's, that says it all because... Uh, those are the kind of choices that people are having to make, right? I mean, when people, you know, they work hard uh, every day for, you know, people around this country, and then one day people say, well, either you're going to work without pay or we're going to furlough you involuntarily, you're, the, the bills don't stop, no. right? The costs don't stop. So um, we, we really think it's important, um, as was said, you know, if the, if the president thinks he can relate, well, uh, I don't think he's relating to the people who are going paycheck to paycheck and what this uh, means uh, to them. So um, that, that's why we got to keep getting the word out. And I, I mentioned uh, I've just been talking a couple times today to Senator Cardin, uh, also up, uh, on the phone all day today with Senators Kane and Warner in Virginia, and uh, Steny Hoyer, Anthony Brown, the Maryland delegation, of course, have been very active. Uh, in the House of Representatives, Eleanor Holmes Norton and others, and trying to push this uh, forward as, uh, as well. Well, thank so, you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'll turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Senator. First, I'd like to say we appreciate that the work that you do. We see it, and we appreciate it. More than 20 years ago, I became a federal employee. I was told that if I went to school and did the right thing, I could live the American dream. I'm the only one in my family my only one in my immediate family, only sibling that went to college. I got a job with the federal government, which I was very proud. I've worked very hard to, to live the American dream and to do the right things. I bought my own home. I own my own home, or really the bank owns my home. <laughs> and now I'm worried about what am I going to do every day, every single day, you know. It's unfortunate now that we're in a time where every few months we have to worry about a CR and whether the government is going to shut down. That does nothing for our morale. We've had to refocus our entire lives on um, preparing for government shutdowns. This cost the American public and, and many, many people millions of dollars. It not only affects federal employees, it affects contractors, it affects the people that we do business for, the people that depend on us to spend money, it affects our families, it affects the American public. The president needs to stop playing games and put people back to work. I don't know of any other company or any other agency or any other place where you require people to work and not pay them. Yeah. And surely the federal government should not be one of them. You, you, you said it right on target, right? I mean, you're asking, mil you're asking hundreds of thousands of people to work without pay, and then you're sending a hundred thousands more home on furlough uh, so they can't do their job and uh, they obviously don't get their paycheck either. You wouldn't run a small company that way 
a large we're talking company. or a large company. I'm so, I was going to say or the U.S. government, right? I mean, you shouldn't run the United States government in a way that you wouldn't run any other kind of enterprise. It makes no sense. So thank thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Laverne Bird, and I am the first vice president of Local 2782 at the U.S. Census Bureau, and I represent AFGE and over 5,000 employees. And the majority of our employees are home on furlough. Uh, and like it's been said, our employees work paycheck to paycheck. Uh, I don't know how they're going to, you know, make their mortgages. I'm fortunate I have a husband, so that helps out. But there are other things, um, you know, like I do have medication that I have to take, you know, and mine is prescribed. How am I going to pay for my medication? Um, that's a concern. Um, pretty soon we're going to have to worry about how are we going to be able to get from place to place because we have to pay for gas like somebody else mentioned. These are the small things that people don't think about. And I think that um, the president doesn't understand that we are human beings. We are people. Federal workers, that's just like, you know, words, federal workers. No, no, no. I am the federal worker. He is the federal worker. We are people. We have bills to pay. We have mortgages to pay. We have food. We, we need to eat to survive just like everybody else. Um, it's not a game to us. I mean, it seems like it's a game to him. Oh, I'll keep, it shut, keep the government shut down for months, for years. Well, what about the 800,000 people? Do you even care? Do you have a heart? It doesn't seem so. But anyway, so um, we are suffering out here, and not just the federal employees, but those that work around us, as Ed said. Uh, we have contractors. We have people that service the um, government buildings. We have cafeterias. All these people are affected as well. People in the community are affected. So like I said, it's not a game. Um, please wake <coughs> up. We are human beings. We are suffering. Please let us go to work. Thank you. And I, I should point out that while this is obviously a gathering here in Maryland, and there are, of course, lots of federal employees in Maryland and Virginia and the Washington, D.C., larger metropolitan area, that 80 percent, 80 percent of federal employees live outside of uh, right. this area, all over the, the country. Um, and so this is a story being told in states around the country. So thank you. Um, Thank you, Senator Van Hollen. Uh, and I want to join my colleagues in thanking you for all that you're doing to really try to address this injustice that the shutdown is, is visiting on employees and um, also on the public and on the agencies that are really trying to serve the public. Um, I'm the president of Chapter 337 of the National Treasury Employees Union, and I work at the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is a agency that regulates the financial markets. Um, NTEU also represents, represents employees at a number of other um, agencies uh, that have also been shut down, and that includes the Internal Revenue Service and the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, the uh, uh, FDA, and also the Commodity Futures, uh, the uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So, um, and, and as everyone has heard here, there are so many different agencies that have been affected by this, and it's amazing the range of agencies. We've got the National Gallery of Art, we've got Goddard, we've got the Census Bureau, we've got parole supervision. Even though this is a partial shutdown, it is affecting the public and the government across the board. Um, with respect to my agency, um, we regulate the financial markets, and we try to ensure that um, that, that the financial markets function fairly. We prosecute cases that, uh, where there are bad actors in the financial markets. We prosecute fraud, and because of the shutdown, all of those cases have been suspended. Um, when there's a shutdown, my agency, this is also true of the SEC and other agencies, we have to go to court and we have to ask the courts to suspend the cases because we do not have the resources to prosecute those cases and to get those bad actors off the street. So that's, that's one thing just at my agency and other agencies with court cases that's happening. In addition, our shutdown also affects um, uh, private companies because companies come to financial regulatory agencies and other agencies to get approval to do certain things, like if they want to change 
how um, change rules on exchanges, that uh, where people buy and sell financial products, we have to approve that. If they want to get approval to, um, to sell a new product like Bitcoin or other virtual currencies, um, those are things that agencies have to approve. So this shutdown is also affecting, um, it's, it's affecting private industry, it's affecting the private sector. But, um, but speaking from, uh, the, you know, <coughs> speaking of, from the heart of um, my situation and that of my colleagues at my agency and my colleagues here at the table, um, it's, I think the thing that is, I don't know if it's the worst, but one of the things that's so awful about this shutdown is that it's the uncertainty of not knowing when this is going to end. And hearing statements like, this shutdown could last years, it could last indefinitely, um, said in ways that are just so heartless. We really, truly are pawns. Um, in my situation, my husband also works for the federal government, although his agency is not shut down, but I have a lot of colleagues at work um, who are in situations where both spouses have been furloughed. Um, I have to make some really tough choices about um, paying my mortgage. Um, I have a, um, my mother has, was me recently widowed and my ability to take care of her is impacted by this shutdown. Um, and um, it's, we're just pawns in what's going on. And the American public is also a pawn in this. Thank you. Oh, thank you for having this forum. My name is Ashaki Robinson Johns. I am president of AFGE Local 476. Uh, we represent around 3,000 people that work at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development um, with a membership of around 1,200. And uh, the past couple of weeks, I've spent some time, you know, online because I haven't been working. I've been locked out from my job, you know, surfing the internet and looking in the comments section. And one of the things that's come up quite often for people who either don't work with the federal government or are very partisan about this issue in particular is that, well, people should just save money and they should have six months in, in their bank account and this isn't a big deal and they shouldn't be living paycheck to paycheck. And, you know, this is what happens in the private sector. It's not really a big deal. But the fact of the matter is that this isn't normal. There is nothing normal about putting 800,000 800, people out of work for a political fight. I mean, this is about ego. This is not even about immigration at this point. It's about, you know, I'm right, you're wrong, and you're going to admit that you're wrong. We're pawns. This is not normal. It's become our normal, but it's not normal. There's nothing normal about it. There's nothing normal with asking people to work and not get paid. Yeah. There's nothing normal about asking people who have committed their careers, their life, to federal service, to public service, and they can't do it. I work in an agency where about 95% of the people um, believe in the mission. You know, we're, we're housing people, we're housing veterans, we're housing the disabled and the elderly, and the people who cannot and, and cannot, who are underemployed. We can't do that. If how, public housing goes bad right now, if there's some type of emergency, they don't know what they're going to do. And the larger public housing authorities that do might have some money to take care of emergencies that might happen with public housing, they might be okay. So a place like New York or Miami or in Dallas. But what about some of the areas that are a lot smaller that really only service the elderly and the disabled? What's going to happen to them? This is not about just the federal workers because apparently there's not a whole lot of sympathy for federal workers. I mean, you know, who cares what happens to them? They get paid too much whatever the rhetoric is that's around federal workers. But the fact of the matter is, we're American citizens. We've worked, we've committed our lives to public service, and we should be able to not be locked out of our job, and we should be able to go to work for the public, because that's what we're committed to. Yeah. So I, I mean, I thank you for the opportunity <coughs> to talk about this, but honestly, it's really about more than just us. It is about who we serve yep. and what our mission is. Thank you, and thank you. That, that, that's a exactly right and what you are seeing and I think the public is experiencing this now more and more every day is the impact of that loss of uh, services in this partial government shutdown. Thank you. Thanks again, uh, Thank you. Senator Rahman. Uh, my name is Johnny Zugar. I'm a president of Census Bureau AFG Local 2782 in our council. We represent people in Indiana, Kentucky, Arizona, Maryland, Colorado. Virginia, D.C. 
So uh, um, I think this argument is really about the moral character of America, what it means to care about actually people. You know, uh, I got a phone call from one of our union reps in Arizona. He makes $19 an hour. Uh, his, all his workers that work with him, his coworkers, make about $19 an hour. They haven't been to work in three weeks. You know, and he was worried about what's going to happen on Saturday when they don't get their paychecks. You know, and as a leader, I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to say to him. You know, and I thought about, like, you know, why is this happening to us? We're real people. Um, myself, I have three sons. One son is 11 month, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. And every day they watch dad leave the house and go to work to serve the government. And now they're watching me coming back home, not, yeah. not leaving, not going to work. You know, and trying to explain that to a six-year-old to an eight-year-old, hey, you can't buy this, coming out of Christmas is very difficult. Trying to look your wife in the eye, what trying to plan a birthday party next week, and you can't, you really don't, page. I want to get this cake, but you know what, you got to get this cake. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's very di difficult because as a man, you should be able to take care of your family. When you make a commitment to somebody, that commitment matters. Integrity matters. We made a commitment to the federal government. We made a commitment to this way of life that we was going to serve the public. And we've been failed. So when I, what I have to say to Trump is, right now, I feel like we are the forgotten Americans. We're the people that he said that he's going to protect. He said that he's going to do, he's going to do everything yeah. for us. And now we cannot go to work for a wall. That's what we're arguing about. So we want him to open up the government so people can go to work. But when, once I heard when you say we're going to be going for years, the first thing I'm thinking about is i got to move on. Maybe this is not the place for me because at the end of the day, my first obligation is to my family. I can't tell my son, hey, you know, I'm, I'm on furlough two months, three months, and four months because I have to pay my bills. So um, if you're a reporter in this room, just report on what's, the, what's real. He said that we are all Democrats. We are all human beings. And how you treat people matters. Your position being a president doesn't make you a leader. A true leader takes care of the people under them. A true leader eat last. So just open up the government. Thank you. And you're, you're right. People need to be leading here by example. Um, and that's why I, we thought it was so important that we begin this conversation about the impact that it's having uh, on, on workers around the country uh, and, and on – you know, got federal workers and the impact on the pocketbook and the inability to pay bills and the stories around this uh, room. Uh, and then, as a number of you indicated, uh, you've also got small businesses and contractors. And the uncertainty of this all uh, means that you can't plan in your life, right? You're already you're stretched you're stretched thin, and then you have no idea how this is going to be resolved. Which brings me back to my initial point, which is what. The Senate just needs to pass the legislation that's sitting in the Senate right now that's already passed the House. I mean, literally, Mitch McConnell has the keys to have a vote to reopen the government. Now, if the president wants to veto that bill, that's fine. But the, pre the Senate and Senate Republicans um, should not be ducking their responsibilities in this, especially, as I indicated, because the two bills in the Senate – are bills that have already been supported by Senate Republicans. So they're saying they just don't care. It's not something they disagree with. They already voted for them, these bills. And so the only reason to sit on those bills is to punish people around the country and punish federal employees and uh, small business contractors for something they have nothing, nothing to do with. And that's wrong. That's not the way uh, anybody should be conducting business. So. I want to thank all of you for being here. Does anybody want to make some final comments before we uh, – the press may have questions of all of you, some of you or me. Yeah. One thing. Um, at the National Gallery of Art under Local 1832, about 90% of the employees there are veterans. It is a veteran-made job created by the founders of the National Gallery of Art. Yeah. And – President claims that he loved veterans. Open the government back up so these vets can get back to work. That's what we're asking. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad you raised that because, uh, in fact, 30 percent, 30 percent of the federal workforce are veterans, right? Who, who serve their country uh, in uniform in the military, and now we're serving their country in, in different ways uh, for uh, the federal government. 
and they're being hurt along with everybody else uh, in this process. So, um, yeah. Forty percent of our employees are veterans too. Forty, forty percent. Yeah. Right. So you know, yes. I would like to say I, I want to follow your comment. We urge the president. Put the bill before the Senate and let y'all do your job y'all supposed to do. Yeah. Okay? If we if those bills <coughs> are the same bills that as you stated, then this process should move forward. And then deal with the issue about the border security. If it's through February eighth, as a, one of my colleagues, we continue continue the resolution. We can't do business this way. Yeah. Okay? There's no way to run a business, okay? All right. So stop holding the American public, the workers hostage for political gain. Put the bill before this. Let's vote and reopen the government. Yeah, we could we could do it as soon as we get in tomorrow. The United States Senate. We could vote on the uh, House uh, bills that would immediately not just open eight of the nine agencies, but open those eight for the full fiscal year at at levels of funding that were agreed to by Republicans and Democrats. And then, as you say, uh, you know, let's let's work our, at our keep the Department of Homeland Security open. For goodness sakes but then work out our, our differences over a period of time. So thank all of you very much. Happy to uh, try and answer any questions uh, from any of you. The, yep. the president says and has said that he believes the majority of the federal workers support this shutdown. Could we see a show of hands of which one of you support the federal shutdown? Thank you. It was a good, a good question, and it uh, goes to a number of statements the president's uh, made that are not, um, not based in any kind of reality. I'm afraid, but that's a good point. Any other questions from anybody here? Um, yes. Actually, I do. Uh, there was a point in time where Democrats were uh, supporting some amount of uh, money for Wall in order to get this through, but then of course uh, Trump shut it down. In order to get the government back open again, would you be, would Democrats be more open to proposing? Uh, money for a wall if that's what it took to get the government running again? So what, what Democrats have supported is strong border security. And all the experts tell us that strong border security requires a certain number of things. Obviously, you need border patrol. You need technology to detect uh, individuals crossing. You need airplanes, and you need barriers in certain areas and sections. And long before President Trump was elected president, there have been barriers along certain parts of the border, and certain, certainly the populated areas along the border. But what President Trump has called for is a 2,000-mile wall or slats, whatever you want to call it. And the reality is that that just doesn't provide effective border security, number one. Number two, we have provided funds for effective border security on a bipartisan basis. And again, I would remind people uh, that while the president talked about the 2,000-mile wall during the campaign, he also said repeatedly during the campaign that Mexico uh, was going to pay for the wall, not American taxpayers. And let me just point out that uh, whatever amounts we're talking about here, to actually build a 2,000-mile wall is ultimately around 28 to 30 billion dollars. And so we can't get ourselves in a position where every time the president doesn't get exactly what he wants, he decides to throw a temper tantrum and shut down uh, the government at the cost of, you know, the, the impact it's having on people's lives, uh, both employees uh, and people around the country who are going to increasingly lose services that have been provided. Any other questions? Thank you all very much. Uh, for, for joining us, and especially thank you to all of you for sharing your uh, stories. Thank you. Thank you.